Let's try again. Good morning. Good morning. That was better. Good morning. Good morning. There we are. Um, okay, so uh, here's the plan for today. Um, the, I kind of lost a little bit track of time last class, and I didn't give you guys enough time to do the group activity. Can we bring this conversation down? Ladies in the back. Thank you. So um, I did not give enough time for this, uh, this activity. So could you guys go to page 27? And I just want to give maybe five, ten minutes to just kind of do one of these problems, make sure we remember what's happening with um, the method of plurality with elimination. So on page 27, there's a preference schedule at the top. And I'm going to ask you to do two parts of this question right here on page 27. I'm going to ask you guys to do part B and D. B as in boy, D as in dog. Page 27, B and D. Can you guys work with each other and work through those two parts? I know some folks finish these things up as part of their homework, and that's great. Maybe you could help the folks who didn't have a chance to get to look at it uh, over the last couple of nights. But let's just have a look and uh, kind of summarize, make sure we're all um, uh, feeling OK about some of these new methods. Uh, the boredom method, I think we got a lot of practice with last time. That was the one with the points. I, I didn't want us to spend time doing this because I, I think we spent a lot of time last class. So I've written here just so I could see the table above. But this is the plurality with elimination. If you see the word plurality, what kind of votes are you counting? First place. That's what plurality means. You count the first place votes. It turns out if we were just doing plurality, C would win. That would be the end of the game. But this is plurality with elimination. So you have to ask yourself if somebody has a majority. Does anybody have a majority? No. So we eliminate the person with the fewest number of first place votes. And that's B. And then literally, you can see I cross all the Bs out of my table. And then I count again, first place votes only. The A row doesn't change. They still have those two. But here in the next columns, these votes that used to go to B are now going where? They're now going to A, because A is the next person in that column. So A gets those first place votes. These ones used to go to B, but now who do they get? Who, who do they go to? It's going to C. And so you recalculate first place, but notice that first place might no longer be in the top row. And uh, I added them up again, and I got 49 and 51. Of course, it still adds up to the same 100 that it added up before. Um, and now C has a majority, so they win. Any questions about plurality with elimination? OK, so we're going to jump down to part D. In terms of uh, uh, part D, it refers to uh, a criterion that we actually kind of skipped over last time. We didn't read it out loud to each other. Um, but let's, uh, let's have a look at part D here. Uh, it says we'll have a, a reader here. Can we go to Polly? Okay, so first let's make sure we see the relationship between this schedule and the one above. So it said the 3%, that's the second column, decided to change to the last column, okay? They didn't like A anymore. They changed to this last column. So the 3% column is going to be disappeared. It used to be 36, but now how much is it? It's 39. Everything else you can just check is the same. It's now a 39. Okay, and so then we want to know the outcome using each of the methods above. So you can do Borda, uh, you can do plurality with elimination. Let's just see what happens if we do uh, plurality with elimination. Again, looking at first place votes only, how many first place votes does A have? A has 30, B, 31, and then C has 39. Okay, and then uh, who are we going to eliminate now? We're going to eliminate A. So let's do that. Eliminate A. So now we're down to B and C. And literally, I crossed off all the A's in my schedule. And you can see that, again, first place votes are the only ones that matter. Largely, they're unaffected. But this first column is going to change. Those votes used to go to A. Who do they go to now? They go to B. So if you give B all those votes, how many does B get? 61. So this is 
uh, 61 votes here, which leaves 39 for C. So who wins? B wins. And this is supposed to be surprising because the people who moved, where did they send their votes to? They used to be a 3% here. Did they? These people right here, where did they move to? I'll show you again. The last column used to be 36, right? They moved over to the last column. So who did these people that left, these people that they, they thought A was the best, they moved over here to, reckon, to, to indicate that they thought C was the best, right? So C did better. Who won the plurality with elimination in the beginning? C, right? But then these folks that liked A, they decided, wait a minute, I, I think C is better now that I, I've got new information. So if C won before, and then some folks decided to rank C even higher than they did before, then it seems like C should win. C should win even more easily than it did. But what happened? Who won? B. Is that not surprising? C had this election wrapped up. And then some people decided C was even better than they thought before. And then C lost. And it doesn't seem fair, right? Like if you were C or if you were working for the, you know, like if you were working with C trying to get C elected, you'd be kind of annoyed that this happened. You would say this is not fair, right? C was going to win. Then some people decided to vote for C even better. And then C lost. Okay, so it's not fair. And we have a name for this unfairness. And it's, uh, it's the thing that we skipped over last time. So this seems like a good time to just come back and take a look. Yeah, the mana nana, this guy. Monotonicity. Monotonicity. Can we go to Emma? Uh, Holly, can you show her where we are? Hold on one second. Hold on. We're on, we're on a different page. We're looking for the monotonicity criterion. It's on page 23. Down at the bottom. Uh, we're doing the Condorcet thing. We didn't talk about the Condorcet thing, and we'll do some Condorcet stuff today. We didn't do C, not together, not together. Yeah. Okay, Emma. This is what we just saw. Went, this, this went wrong in the election we just looked at. Candidate C was the winner. And then some people decided when there was a revote that they were going to put C even higher on their ballot. But everybody else stayed the same. C should still win. But they didn't. And so monotonicity seems reasonable. But we just saw an example that shows that plurality with elimination violates this criterion. That's what we saw. So we're going to write it just to get more practice with the uh, way we can write these kinds of things. So I'm back on page 27. And uh, so what we see is that plurality with elimination violates the monotonicity criterion. So remember we had these two side-by-side -side tracks that we were thinking about. We had the one track over here with different methods to try to find a winner of an election. Just find the winner. And then we had this parallel track over here. Let's look at what you did to find the winner and decide whether or not we think it was fair. And this is an example of something coming up which just wasn't fair. Um, and so I just want to point out that on the very first page of this big document, is a voting method summary. 
which kind of lays out both of these tracks on one piece of paper. So just something for you to know if you ever need a reference, a place to go where you'll find all the different tracks, it's here. The first four things are our different voting methods. That's the one track, find the winner. And then down below, you see the fairness criteria. That was the other track. There's four things on each track. So far, we have seen three and three. Plurality, Borda, plurality with elimination. We found winners using three different methods. Then we analyzed whether or not these things were fair with three different methods, three different criteria over here. There was the majority criterion, the Condorcet criterion, and then finally this monotonicity criterion. So it's three and three, ultimately four and four. We've got one more thing to do. We're doing it today. So let's see if we can find the right page here. And you guys jump to page 28. Okay, we'll go to Phil for number one at the bottom. Okay, this should not sound new. This should sound quite familiar. We've been comparing candidates head to head for quite a while, right? What have we been calling it? The Condorcet. Which track was it on? Do you remember? Like every time we've been doing head to head stuff, was it to find a winner or was it to see if it was fair? It was to see if it was fair. Every, every time we're doing head to head, it's just to see if things are fair. This is the method that brings this fairness criterion over to this track. Let's do head to heads and find a winner. We'll go to Wadata for the for each. So this is how we give them points. This is how we find a winner. Is you, you do your head-to-head -head stuff, and then you award points. So let's try number two, uh, Becca. Okay, so let's try this. R versus D, R versus G, D versus D. Can you guys in your groups do all three of these head-to-heads? Remember, you're putting the numbers in, so you're going to put some number. Uh, I think that uh, over here, R versus D, looks like it's 47, but just see if you can do some calculations. I want to see numbers next to each of these letters. Do your head-to-heads with your neighbors and find out who, um, who gets these points. Are there any questions on the numbers I've put up here? We do every comparison, and I really am going to insist that you show me that you counted. R versus G, you show me that you saw 65 people like R and 35 people prefer G. I want to see those numbers. Now what we're doing, what we used to do was look for a Condorcet candidate, somebody that beats everybody. That's not what we're doing anymore. What we're doing now is every single comparison, and then we give points. Who wins the, uh, the first R versus D? D gets that. Who wins the next one? R. Who wins the last one? D. And so now we're awarding points. So here are the points. R, D, and G. Every time you win, you get a point. Every time you lose, you get zero. Who gets the first point, we said, is D. Second point, R. Third point. D. One point for R, two for D, zero for G. Who wins? D wins with two points. Brittany, is that all right? Okay. That's how we do it. So that's how we get from the fairness thing. We, we, we talked about fairness and head-to-heads to, -heads to uh, how do you find a winner? We find a winner by awarding points. If it's a tie, what would we do? Half a point for each one, right? Is that how it works in hockey? 
like pro hockey. Is it half a point for each? Yeah. But then there's there's still oh there's never ties. Oh, you're right. There are shootouts. I'm thinking. Um, okay, so this is called the method of pairwise comparisons because you look at every pair and you compare. Okay, we'll go to three, Maggie. Okay, so it could be that a lot of folks end up tying for the win, and then what do you do? Uh, but also, you guys kind of already were annoyed, and there were only three candidates here. It's like, oh, God, I have to do three comparisons. But if there were, all right, so if there's, if there's three candidates, what did we say? How many comparisons? you got to do three different head-to-heads, right? Three comparisons. If there's four candidates... Well, I'm just going to list them, and then and then I'll write down a formula. Um, we've got one vote for six here. Let's see. So four candidates, A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, right? Who else? And then C versus D. And I think that's all of them with four letters. So this is six comparisons, and Becca is saying, well, we, that looks familiar. We've, we've done stuff like this before. Okay, so how do we come up with a way to do it? I mean, if there's 10, I don't want to list them all. There's quite a bit. There's 10. Becca says exclamation point. So um, let's see. We have three, and we have six. Is it an exclamation point? Is it nine times 10? I mean, this, like, do you guys remember the exclamation point? Like, three with an exclamation point really meant three times two times one. How much was that? That's six. That's, that's, all right, that is that number. I don't know if it's why it's that number. But how about two exclamation point, two factorial? It would be two times one, which is two. Is that another number in the list? Six and two, were those the two numbers that we're looking at? I had three comparisons and then six. But it's not these numbers, right? It's a reasonable thing to think, well, wait, wait we've, we've done this kind of thing before. Unfortunately, the factorial numbers are not exactly the numbers I want. Six is good, but I need something to give me three, not a two. So it turns out there is a nifty little formula. It's, it's, not, it's not related to the factorials, but um, some of you might have seen it in your book. I'll write it down here. If you want to compare... Um, N candidates, and you want to figure out how many comparisons you're going to have to do. Uh, we're going to come back to something that Ashley had said. Ashley, what did you say for 10 candidates? Ashley said 9 times 10. Let's think about this. Suppose that uh, we follow Ashley's pattern. Ashley is saying this is 9 times 10. So apparently it's 1 less times the number itself. So what if we try Ashley's formula here? I'm not. I'm totally not going to make fun of you. This is, uh, this is 4 times 3, right? Ashley's saying take the number and multiply by 1 less. Is that the right answer? What was the right answer for the number of comparisons? It was 6. Ashley says 12. Let's pause. Let's try Ashley's formula here. What do we do? 3 times 2. What is that? That's 6. What was the right answer? What was the right answer? It was 3. Ashley's giving us numbers 6. We want 3. She says 12, we want 6. What do we do with Ashley's formula to fix it? Is you divide it by 2. That's how we fix it. Take this guy, divide it by 2. Take it, divide it by 2. Take it, divide it by 2. That's the right number. So if we're trying this in general, n candidates, n times what? And minus 1, 1 less, and then divide by 2. There's the formula. So if, for example, everybody in this room was running for president of this class, and we want to do a head-to-head, -head, everybody versus everybody, first, what do we need to count? How many heads? All right, so can you guys count? Just look around the room. How many people are in this room? 
How many? Everybody in the room? Uh, yeah, everybody. I, I would like a chance to run for president, right? Uh, Why you... Is it 25? OK, we'll just say 25. So if there are 25 of us in the room, and we're going to vote for president, and we need to do a head-to-head, -head, everybody versus everybody, can you guys use this formula and your calculator to figure out how many different comparisons we would need to run? 25 people in this election. I don't know. I just. I didn't. There's actually six people at that table. So did we find 300? 300 is good. So if we have 25 candidates, then we use Ashley's formula modified with that division by two. 300 comparisons. 300 different comparisons in this room. Do you buy it? Like, do you see? It's hard to see, but do you see it? Everybody versus everybody. Think about it. Can you stand up? Can you stand up? Here's one comparison. Yes? Have a seat. Stand up. That's another comparison. Have a seat. Stand up. That's another comparison. We'll go all the way around the room with her standing up. Then you can sit down. You're all done. And then you stand up and go head to head against this gentleman. And you're still up. And against her. And down and up. And everybody against him. And everybody against him. And everybody against him. Right? That's a lot of comparisons. How many? Exactly 300. Who has time for this, Ashley says. Well, all right, computers are much better at this kind of thing than we are. But as Maggie read, this is one of the downsides to this method is that there are a lot of comparisons if you have a bunch of candidates. OK. Upsides. Number four. Uh, I think we're up uh, here. Uh, Mary. Okay, here are some real upsides. For the first time, we have one of these methods on this track over here that satisfies all three of the fairness criteria on the other track. So far, this is perfect. This is exactly what we were looking for. Uh, uh, if we are going to do this election, you would have 25 names in front of you, and you'd say, I think she's the best, he's second best, she's third best, she's fourth, he's fifth. You'd have to like rank everybody. Okay, we'll go to five. Uh, Jason. Charlie. Okay, let's make sure we believe that this is fair, reasonable. So somebody has already won, everybody's gone out to vote, and, and there's a winner, right? As soon as the votes are in and the polls close, there's some winner, even if it takes us a little while to find it. But now suppose that one of the uh, candidates decides after the votes are in that they're going to drop out of the race for whatever reason. Now, we're not going to ask people to re-vote. They've already voted. But just to cross off this one candidate, they're out of the race, and it's fine. Whoever won the first time, when everybody was still in play, should still win. Even if somebody dropped, right? If, a, if one of the losing candidates drops out, that shouldn't affect the winner. Does that seem fair? You can see that maybe it might affect the winner, right? But I mean, suppose that, that you're, you're backing candidate A, you're running, you know, you're helping them campaign, and the votes are in, and we tally them, and A has won. Hooray. But then for whatever reason, candidate B decides to drop out. And then we retally the votes. We don't go vote again. It's the same ballots that we're looking at, but we retally them. And now all of a sudden, A is not the winner anymore. Does that seem fair to you? 
A won. B was a loser and B dropped out, but then all of a sudden A didn't win. Doesn't seem fair to me. Okay, let's take a look at uh, six. I think we're up to Linda. Okay, and we'll go to Kelly for seven. Okay, so plurality meaning what are we counting? First place only. How many first place votes does R have? It's 45. D, 40. G, 15. Who just won the plurality method? R is the winner, fair and square. That's the end of the election. But for some reason, after the votes were, were, were put into the uh, ballot boxes, G decided, uh, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to withdraw. We cross off all the G's. Those ones don't really matter. It's the ones where G was first place. In the new election, we have R and we have D. How many does R have? It's 47. Same 45 they had before, plus two more. D has 13 more. D has 53. Who wins? D. If you like D, you're happy. But if you've been campaigning for R, and you guys won the election fair and square, but then G decided to drop out, why should that change the outcome of the election? Doesn't seem fair. So on the next page, we get the bad news. Eight, Iris. Okay, so we just looked at uh, pairwise comparisons as the new voting method for today. We were looking good for the first three fairness criteria. Sadly, it turns out it violates this last one, the dropout criterion. Okay, so we're going to kind of summarize and, you know, like, like I said, we were going to talk about four voting methods and four fairness criteria, right? There they are in that table. Your four vote counting methods are in the first column. That's how you pick a winner. Your four fairness criteria are in the top row. That's how you decide if the way you counted the votes was fair. Did it give the right outcome? So, so that's all that, you know, um, that we're really studying and all I'm going to test you on. So last thing I want to talk about today, and then we'll give you a chance to do some practice with this pairwise comparisons, is uh, this thing called approval voting. So I think we're up to uh, Brittany. We'll go to Zach for 11. Okay, we're no longer ranking. There's no first, second, third happening. This is just circle as many of these things as you approve of. You could circle all three. You could circle only one. Any that you approve of, go ahead and circle. And you can approve of none of them. That's okay, too. Okay, let's find the winner. Raise your hand if you approve of vanilla. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, vanilla or some other ones too. Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, counting me. That's fifteen for vanilla. Raise your hand if you approve for chocolate. People that don't want to pass the course. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Ha ha. Raise your hand if you approve of strawberry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I'll count me as thirteen. Who wins? Who won? Who won? Yeah. Vanilla one. Okay. Um. So this is approval voting. Uh. One upside to approval voting is that it kind of tends to get rid of negative campaigning. 
if you've been watching any of the stuff happening with the Republican nominees, there's a lot of negative campaigning in terms of advertisement, right? It's not really about how good I am, it's about how bad my opponent is. If you're going for an approval vote, you don't need to convince the people that your opponent is bad. You need to convince them that they should approve of you. So it tends to get rid of some of the, the negative campaigning stuff. One downside, um, we said there were 25 people in this room, right? 25 voters, that's what we had. Did somebody have a majority of our 25 voters? Who? Vanilla had a majority. Strawberry also had a majority. Okay, this is kind of a problem, right? It's, it's not really fair to the Strawberry fans. Strawberry had a majority. They should win. That's one of our, that's one of our criteria. Um, so you can see here's an example where this approval voting violates the majority criterion. You could get a majority, but not win. In fact, they might all have a majority. You guys remember that was the order that, yeah. that we that we picked them before? Yeah, and th this is you can see that the outcome changes depending on how you count the vote. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to skip past. Uh, we'll just mention a little bit about our friend. Uh, this is Condorcet. Uh, and uh, anybody speak French? Anybody feel like they, uh, is Portuguese anything like a, can you say that name with a nice accent? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, so uh, keep going, Phil. Okay, uh, all right, we're gonna go back to Ashley, he advocated. Minorities, minorities. Okay, so a little bit about the man behind this method that we've been using, Doug. So kind of a sad ending. Um, somebody that seemed to be for a lot of things that, that I would expect that were for as well. Um, okay, voting activity number three. You guys have 29 minutes. Let's see if you can get through this and the stuff on the pages that follow.